Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the kind introduction and, and, and for the invitation, uh, Fairuz and, and uh, Green Mina uh, Network. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for hosting this, this very important conversation. That is, there's often um, uh, confused and confusing, uh, despite being one of the most important issues uh, for, for Tunisia and for the global south in general, for, for Africa in, in particular. So I'll, I'll start with some opening remarks, just highlighting some key concepts and key issues that we that we must uh, understand so that we can frame the conversation in, in the right direction. Uh, the first thing I want to highlight is that um, the issue of lack of food sovereignty happens to be one of the main sources of external debt for Tunisia uh, and for the global south in general. At the, uh, at the continental level in, in Africa, according to UNCTAD, the UN Conference on Trade and Development, uh, the last uh, data report we have on this issue is telling us that Africa today imports 85% of its food. When you go back uh, less than 100 years ago, you will immediately recognize that Africa used to be the breadbasket for colonial powers, major producer of, of, of food globally, uh, a, a very rich continent in terms of um, uh, agricultural land, arable land, and water resources. Uh, yes, we've had the impact of climate change and droughts and desertification and so on, but that is not the reason for this structural deficiency. The main reason for the structural deficiency can be traced back to the early days of independence uh, on this continent, uh, starting with the, a meeting in Rome, um, one of the building blocks of the European Union, uh, as a matter of fact, where the European countries at the time met and discussed the fact that they need to restore their food sovereignty, that they're so dependent on the former colonies or colonies at the time uh, for their uh, food security. And that started a series of conversations and a process that eventually culminated in the introduction of the Common Agricultural Policy, CAP, which is a basic pillar of the European Union to this day. So the Common Agricultural Policy is essentially an agricultural subsidy system to restore food sovereignty in, in Europe, to uh, make sure that Europe can produce the core crops of wheat, barley, corn, rice, soybean, and, and so on, the core crops. And of course, this wasn't just Europe. This was similar to the process that was happening in the US with agricultural subsidies in the US, Canada, Australia, uh, Japan, and of course, the former Soviet Union, which is why Russia and the Ukraine today also are some of the key producers of these core crops. Now, what was the impact in the global south, in Africa, in Tunisia uh, also? The impact was directly um, displacing farmers that used to produce wheat, that used to produce corn, that used to produce barley. They couldn't compete with the cheaper imported wheat from the subsidizing countries, from Europe, from Russia, Ukraine, the US, and so on. So what are farmers to do when they can't compete? The most uh, obvious thing they resorted to because their governments were not subsidizing them to match the subsidies from the global north. They had to switch to cash crops or uh, exports. So instead of producing wheat and barley and corn, you start producing more coffee, more tea, more tobacco, more cocoa, more you know, tomatoes and strawberries and bananas for exports because those are supplementary, complementary uh, crops. And the more you do this, you transition to the current system, which is when uh, where we, we produce what we don't consume and we consume what we don't produce. And with the introduction of this reorganization of the global food system comes the concept of food security, which on the surface of it, it sounds great. I mean, who doesn't like food security? Of course, you know, we want food security, except that this is a loaded technical term that doesn't mean what you and I understand when we hear food security in the colloquial sense of the term. Food security means you secure the nutrition of your people, either by producing the food yourself 
or by buying it from abroad or by borrowing money to be more precise to buy it from abroad which is what we typically do these days or worse than that by receiving it as food aid food aid is the worst thing you can do to your farmers to your agriculture because nobody can compete with free food donated from abroad as as charity so this is exactly what happened in the early 1960s and as we transition to the concept of food security rather than food sovereignty we started digging ourselves deeper into an external debt problem in the 1960s many countries including in tunisia experienced what you can describe as 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 mini crises mini famines mini food supply disruptions that were immediately you know fixed with food aid from usa other other places of course it ended up in being famine in some countries but for the most part most countries were quote unquote rescued with food aid and food aid was the last coffin in the nail of food sovereignty in in Tunisia and the global south there's another dimension that's extremely dangerous and now today we're facing the consequences of uh, of the damage that was done with this process which is an ecological damage um that translates into food insecurity and 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 degradation of the quality of the soil and so on when you start rearranging your agriculture to prioritize exports of cash crops then you start thinking about the taste of your consumers right in the global north typically what do they want to consume and you gradually start bringing in non-native crops that you can plant and export non-native crops that cannot uh, adapt very well to your to your climate, to your droughts, which means crops that need irrigation rather than the rain-fed agriculture that we typically have in, uh, in uh, most of the, the continent, especially in Tunisia. So you need water irrigation infrastructure. You need to bring in fertilizers, that is importing fertilizers for those crops and importing pesticides so that whatever you're producing can survive the journey all the way to supermarket in Geneva or Germany or whatever. So all of that is important inputs. And the logistical infrastructure for export-oriented agriculture means it's very energy-intensive infrastructure. The infrastructure itself is important, but it's also energy-intensive for transportation, refrigeration, and so on. So it's it your agriculture turns into more extractive industry than uh, self-sufficiency, self-sustaining type of agricultural um, system. And then you have the process of, you know, cash crops for exports with this infrastructure, with the water, fertilizers, and pesticides use. It means that after 20, 30, 40 years of doing this to your land, you end up killing the fertility of your soil especially when you do this on, on, a, on an industrial scale, monoculture. When you kill the fertility of your soil, you have an economic problem. And now what do you do? You have to double down on using more potent seeds, more potent fertilizers, more potent uh, pesticides. And, and that becomes you know, the vicious cycle of shooting yourself in the foot. And you fast forward to today, and that's how you get an entire continent importing 85% of its food. Right, which is the, the case of the African continent. The other thing that you end up doing is you, you double down in terms of cultivating more acreage right, to make up for the decline in yields. So you move to burning the next you know, piece of land next door and you do this uh, systematically. The other thing I want to make sure we highlight, because this is a global phenomenon, this is not just in Tunisia or in Africa, uh, and I want to get the numbers straight, so I'm looking at my notes here. Um, what happened in the last 100 years or so is that uh, we, as, as humanity, we moved from uh, a, a system, an agricultural system, a food system, where we used to have 30,000 edible plant species that you know, humanity used to consume. You know, very diverse, non-monoculture type of system where we had, you know, traditionally harvested 7,000 species of food, 7,000. 
we now move to today's world where we uh, uh, basically have a system where 60% of our diet globally in Africa, Tunisia is very similar, 60% of our diet is based on three crops only, wheat, corn, and rice. So we go from that diversity of nutrition sources to a system where three crops dominate our diet. 90% of our nutrition comes from 20 plant species, 20 alone, from 7,000 down to 20. So this is, of course, not just an economic problem, not uh, an international trade problem, not an ecological problem. This is you know, clearly a biodiversity crisis that we're dealing with and biodiversity that's affecting us as humans, our nutrition, our health, uh, and so on. So how do we how do we dig ourselves out of this uh, of this mess? The, the solution, is, as most of the literature makes very clear, is strategic investments in food sovereignty and agroecology, not food security, food sovereignty. So food sovereignty means you, you engage in a very um, intentional process of paying attention to the entire production process from the seed all the way to the final consumer. And to restore the level of biodiversity, or at least some level of biodiversity, it takes, you know, as they say, all hands on deck, which means it's not just the government and the subsidies and, and the nutritionists and the scientists, scientists and, and, and the agricultural sector per se. It also takes popular culture because we can produce these crops today. We can rescue some of these crops, but we don't even know how to cook them. We don't know how to use them. You know, you serve them in restaurants, nobody will touch them, right? So we need an entire sort of cultural revolution using all the social media influencers, all the sports influencers, right? All the health influencers to restore a culture of nutrition that is much more diverse than, you know, relying essentially exclusively on three crops. Um, and, and that takes strategic planning on a national and global scale. That means you start with education. You know, you're not going to convince, you know, people in their 60s and 70s to, you know, start tasting new dishes and, and new, you know, food habits. It, it takes, yes, some of that can happen with, you know, older generations, but you have to build it from the ground up, starting with the younger generation, starting a new sort of uh, uh, gastronomy culture where we can actually value, right, this nutrition and, and taste that we've lost as, as humanity, but also value it economically so that you actually create the market that will incentivize the cultivation of a, of a new agroecology uh, and, and, uh, and biodiversity basis for agriculture, uh, because you have to get the economics straight. It's not enough to just subsidize everything and incentivize uh, from kind of from, from a push factor. You have to get the consumers on board and that's all of us. So I, I wanted just to start the conversation with just these few, um, you know, hopefully provocative uh, thoughts about the problems uh, and, and how they were created, uh, how all of us participated in, in the creation and how all of us need to be involved in the strategic transformation. Thank you again for the opportunity. Um, Thank you. The, the disruption of the um, food system, global food system that happened in the 1950s and 60s, as I mentioned earlier, did lead to famines and mini famines. And, and of course, when I say mini famines, it's a, it's a sanitized term for saying lots of people ended up in, in situations of hunger, food insecurity, and, and malnutrition. Um, but, it, but it's not just the agricultural system that led to structural uh, lead to economic disruptions that are food insecurity. And uh, a big, you know, uh, source of that is the external debt, which is related to energy deficits in the global south, because no country can function without food, without energy. Energy is critical for transportation, for irrigation, for for public health and, uh, and, and so on. 
um, but also the global economic architecture that further reinforced the colonial role of the global south as the place for cheap raw materials to be extracted uh, for the industrialized world, as the place that consumes industrial output from the global north as in, in our large consumer markets, and, and more, more specifically, more importantly, as the place where obsolete technologies, assembly line manufacturing that is no longer needed in the industrialized world is much to the global south to be assembled with low cost labor, uh, uh, you know, for under the label of development and cooperation, but effectively it locks the bottom of the global value chain with a manufacturing base that produces low or high value added content. So that, and you have a systemic structural trade deficit that eats up your fiscal policy space year after year and forces in defense economic policy. Because with the trade deficit, your current becomes higher at a higher real cost, which means we import inflation in the most sensitive areas, food and fuel and medicine. And the defensive mechanism that countries like Tunisia have used since then is to subsidize food, subsidize fuel, subsidize medicine, which makes sense to protect the most vulnerable. Your roots of the problem we have food subsidies in Tunisia, subsidizing the producers in the global north from whom we purchase agriculture. We're not subsidizing Tunisian farmers. So you end up subsidizing your imports, right? So when you have that kind of defensive mechanism, the second part of the defensive mechanism is what central banks do, which is trying to defend the exchange rate, to stabilize the exchange rate. And we more dollars into the external debt crisis. Have external debt accumulating year after year, decade authorities are real to prioritize export oriented activity, including cash crops for exports, including all the extractive industries. They prioritize dollar revenues to allow you to buy the food at the end of the month to allow service the and that becomes the structural trap. And of course, when you do that, we neglect the building blocks of development and prosperity, including health and nutrition uh, and, and, and uh, infrastructure, let alone all the climate priorities and, and the other priorities that we deal with today. So all of these are interlinked. Um, today, our focus was on, on the food part. And yes, it's related to hunger and malnutrition, but there's an entire system behind it that history that links to energy, that links to external debt, that forces what um, what uh, some economists, including Tunisian economists in the past, used to refer to our economy as an economy that is, you know, a country. We have our flag, our president, our parliament, but our economy is abroad. Our national priorities are steered from abroad. And when you have non-democratic intervention from external Steering your economic, of course, you end up with hunger and malnutrition, uh, and and all the consequent system of economic structurals, uh, of which the the food system is is a component. Very good question. Very good question. Um, it, it is uh, it is a circular argument that uh, that governments use when they don't have. A strategic vision for getting out of that trap. And what I mean by that is that we have, um, uh, if, if you think of, you know, investing in producing, say in Tunisia this year, this agricultural season, we can actually dedicate a little bit of our productive capacity to cultivate and produce one additional metric ton of wheat in Tunisia. 
And instead of one, let's do a hundred. It's a very small amount. So imagine the equivalent of a hundred metric tons of wheat produced domestically saves us the equivalent of dollars and euros that we have to borrow to import that wheat from abroad. And interest we have to pay on that debt for 10 plus years at least, right? So every metric ton of domestically produced wheat, core crops, right? Saves us the equivalent in dollars we had to borrow and interest we had to pay for the next 10 years, right? And this is completely feasible within one agricultural season, right? And as we rearrange our priorities, because currently what we do as part of, you know, quote unquote, our agricultural policy, which is really not our agricultural policy, it's the agricultural policy that's been assigned to us by, say, the European Common Agricultural Policy. Our current priorities is to use the most fertile soil that we have in Tunisia and the most precious, scarce water resources to prioritize producing watermelon and strawberries for exports, right? Not for our food security. And at the same time, struggle to borrow money and pay interest to import wheat from the Ukraine, from Russia, from, from the European Union and other places. So that is the most flagrant misallocation of resources that we have in, in Tunisia. And the solution is within reach. You know, the technical solutions are within reach. It just takes strategic thinking about how we get out of that trap. So, uh, yes, we do need foreign currency reserves for strategic investments, but we're not going to do it by producing more watermelon and strawberries and extracting water resources while we're not actually securing our own nutrition because we still have to borrow to continue importing wheat from, from abroad. I'll give you an extreme example because this is not unique to Tunisia. The, one of the most extreme examples we have in, in Africa is Ethiopia, which is blessed by you know, the most fertile land on the continent and the Nile River, right? All the water resources are available. Ethiopia today, the third largest export item, export revenue item is flowers for Valentine's, cut flowers for Valentine's, that they actually fly to Europe on Ethiopian airlines on a daily basis. Right, the most extractive thing. So, the third largest export revenue item is cut flowers. While at the same time, Ethiopia has 20 million people today who are dependent on food aid from abroad. That is again the most extreme, absurd misallocation of resources. Why does Ethiopia dedicate all of that logistics and infrastructure and to export flowers? Because they're desperate for those dollar revenues. Because they're in a debt trap. Ethiopia, if you look at the last 20 years or so, at some point, Ethiopia uses up to 50% of its export revenues to pay interest on the debt. That's called the debt trap, right? And when you look at the entire African continent with its relations with the global financial institutions over the last several decades, the fact that we're in a debt trap when these financial institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, the rest of the global financial uh, institutions, the fact that they literally dictate our domestic policy choices, economic policy choices, the fact that we're in a debt trap, even though they micromanage our choices, has got to mean one of two things. It means they're either completely incompetent and have no idea what they're dictating, right? And if you're incompetent, you should go away, right? Or it's actually intentional entrapment. And I believe it's the latter. Okay. Um, can I say, say something about about wheat? Yes, of course. Uh, here, here in Tunisia, we export about seventy percent of our needs in wheat, and the the, the state owns about four hundred thousand hectares of land. So, by the public policy only, we can produce enough wheat for uh, for people. Last year. We, we we had a, a bread crisis here in, in, in Tunisia and people had no access to bread, which is which is really horrifying in, in, in our country. So we are exporting two things mainly from this country. First, brains, because almost uh, I I think thirty thousand doctors 
and their equivalent in engineers are exported mainly to northern countries. And we are exporting uh, uh, water dependent uh, products while at the same time we are rationing water or the government is, is rationing water. There are many paradoxes. Our uh, our environmental uh, environmental policy uh, NDCs national uh, determined contributions of the country uh, orients the economy to uh, produce green energy to Europe. So it is a colonize uh, colonization uh, policy imposed mainly from Europe and the international uh, or the global actors like uh, IMF, the, the, the World Bank, and uh, the other uh, uh, strong um, actors in, in, this, in this world. Uh, in Tunisia, in, 19, in 2011, there was a, a revolution between brackets, a revolution which uh put off the head of the state out of the country but those who took the power are the same as those who pushed the country to its ruin and the country is actually uh losing it's better it's better uh products which means mainly uh brains and this is horrifying for the future of 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 our country Tunisia. Thank you. Um, thank you. Then I have um, I have a very interesting remark of uh, Rihanna Verveen, um, one of the participants who said that Ethiopian did export food during the famine of nineteen eighty four. Um, then I have a last question uh, for both of you, if there are no other questions, and that's. Um, What's the fair story? I mean, what will say Dutch people or Tunisia is no longer be able to obtain in their own country? So what should we sacrifice uh, in order to come to more food sovereignty? What would be the impact on Europe, Western Europe? And how do you think we could sell this story? Maybe Fidel, um, you can start. I'm happy to, to start first with uh, with a few thoughts and, and then Maxim, you can uh, come in. Um, there's a, a couple of things to, to acknowledge, to recognize here, that Tunisia alone will not be able to offset the European Union common agricultural policy. It's just not going to work. <laughs> We're too small to, to undo uh, you know, massive agricultural subsidies or the American subsidies or the Japanese or the Australian subsidies. So this is this has to be a global uh, conversation, and this needs to involve, you know, a counterbalance on our side, on our continent, in the context of something that will be, you know, like the African Union common agricultural policy, or at least regional economic blocks. You know, in Africa we have these regional economic communities. So something at that scale, with the complementarity of resources and capabilities, because no country can produce everything by itself. No country can get out of these structural traps by itself, certainly not a small country like Tunisia. With the current challenges of the external debt problem, with the with the droughts that we're experiencing, so we, we're all in this together and we have to come out of this uh, as, uh, as, as regional communities, not as uh, you know national priorities. It doesn't mean that in Tunisia, we can't get started alone. As I said, we can produce 100 metric, you know, tons of, of wheat this next agricultural season. It's totally within reach. It's feasible, right? But it cannot happen when you have an entire um, administrative, you know, political, uh, technical edifice in, in our country that does not understand the difference between food security and food sovereignty, right? And when we have intentional uh, pressure, and I say this from experience, intentional pressure and intervention in African Union meetings and international negotiations, when 
we as African and Global South civil society thinkers and scholars and experts try to push for the concept of food sovereignty and agroecology in official texts in international negotiations, that text gets changed and influenced by experts and policymakers in the global north who know exactly what food sovereignty means, who know exactly what food security means. They intervene and change the text to refer to food security when it comes to Africa and food sovereignty when it comes to Europe. It means they know exactly what they're doing. And, and, and I'm glad, uh, Fairuz, you mentioned this. I mean, the French Ministry of Agriculture, it's called the Ministry of Agriculture and Food Sovereignty, not Food Security. You know, same thing with the Italian Ministry of, of Agriculture. When we had the COVID, uh, not the COVID crisis, the Ukraine um, supply chain disruptions that, that affected food supplies in, in the global south, especially in Africa, you can literally go back to the record and listen to the French Minister of Agriculture speaking to French public about the food disruption uh, issues. And he's reassuring French consumers that they should not worry about this temporary disruption because France, like the rest of Europe, have systematically invested in our food sovereignty since the 1960s. Very clear explanation. And then he goes on to say that we have to intervene now and help and worry about our African friends who don't have food sovereignty. And then he moves on to say we need to secure their nutrition, you know, changing the language very directly. So we have global leaders who know exactly what they're doing when it comes to the global food system. And that you know, goes back to the intentional entrapment that I described. So we have to have an honest conversation about how do we rebalance, how do we fix this, you know, in the context of food insecurity and in the context of the climate crisis uh, that is uh, that is affecting the African continent uh, in particular. So it, this is this is a question of um, uh, of you know ethical and moral <laughs> priorities that need to be settled on a global scale. Thank you.